Shalom and good evening to my friends, my brothers and sisters, to all of my spiritual family, no matter who you are nor where you are. Shalom to you all in our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Your friend and brother in the faith, Jake Hilton here with the Sword of Yehovah Ministries, and I welcome you to this evening's family scripture study from the Chronological Gospels, the Life and 70-Week Ministry of the Messiah. It's difficult to believe that we have now been in the Chronological Gospel series for 10 months. It's been 10 months since we began this series. It began in late July of 2019, and here we are late May of 2020, 10 months later, and it is now that we are in the final week of Yeshua's life. The final week. He goes up to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And there, on the 14th day of the first biblical month, the month of the Aviv, the preparation day for the Passover, he, our Lord, is sacrificed. He who is the Passover lamb given to us by Almighty God, Yehovah, he is crucified. And this is a huge week. There is so much that happens in this week. This evening, we are going to be covering him going up to Jerusalem, and he gets that colt, that male donkey, young male donkey, upon which no one has ever sat. He gets that donkey in preparation for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, a triumphal entry which occurs on the weekly Sabbath. And we're going to be covering the triumphal entry tomorrow evening, which will also be our Shabbat teaching. So very, very appropriate topic to be covering for Shabbat, Yeshua's triumphal entry on the weekly Sabbath. And then there we are in the four days of inspection, the four days when the Passover lamb was inspected to make sure that it was in fact spotless, that there was no blemish upon him. And that's exactly what happens with Yeshua. For four days, the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th of the month of the Aviv, the first biblical month, Yeshua is tested, tested, tested by the people, by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees. They are testing him to the utmost extreme to see if they can find anything wrong with him, to see if they can find anything at all, that any blemish, any spot, anything, but they can't. He is, in fact, that spotless lamb. And then on the preparation day of the Passover, the 14th day of the month of the Aviv, it is, in fact, Pontius Pilate, a Gentile, the Roman governor of Judea, that fulfills the prophetic shadow picture in declaring that this man, who is the lamb of God, the Passover lamb, I find no fault with him. He is, in fact, spotless. There is no fault with him. And then that glorious Passover lamb provided to us by Yehovah God is then sacrificed. He is then crucified on the preparation day. He is in the tomb for three days and three nights, just as he prophesied more than any other prophecy throughout all of the Gospels. And then at evening at sundown on the weekly sabbath he is then raised from the dead he is resurrected by the eternal god jehovah to fulfill the the day of first fruits everything that yeshua does throughout his whole ministry he is fulfilling 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 the word of god and this final week of yeshua's life is certainly no exception he fulfills every prophetic shadow picture concerning his first coming to the very day and even very hour in which all of these things have been prophesied and written about and the Israelites had been practicing every year for the previous 1500 years since the time of Moses. 
It's truly extraordinary to see how the word of Yehovah, the word of the everlasting God, is fulfilled, every jot and tittle fulfilled in his son Yeshua. Certainly concerning his first coming, that's what we need to focus on. There are a great many prophecies concerning Yeshua's second coming that have yet to be fulfilled, obviously. But his first coming, Yeshua fulfills all of it. And here we are in the final week of Yeshua's life on page 191 of the Chronological Gospels. We start in John chapter 11, verse 55. So I invite you to turn there with me. And after our word of prayer, where we praise our Father Yehovah for that gift, that unspeakable gift of his son Yeshua, we will begin this evening's teaching. Thank you again for joining me, and I invite you to now join me in this word of prayer. Thank you. Yehovah, blessed God in heaven, generous and gracious, good and kind and gentle, purifier and sanctifier, comforter, God of love and compassion and forgiveness, God of truth, God of life and light, our God and our Lord Yeshua's God, our Father and our Lord Yeshua's Father. We humble ourselves before you, and we cry out before you, Yehovah. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Yeshua. We cry out, Hosanna, save us, please save us. And we praise you, Father, that you have saved us. You've saved us through sending your son, Yeshua, who is that gift of salvation. We praise you for that Passover lamb who was spotless, without blemish, who was taken from the sheepfolds of Bethlehem, as you, through your prophet Micah, prophesied. We praise you, Father, that we can open up your word and we can see with perfect clarity that your word is true and that your son Yeshua is the Messiah. He is the prophet like Moses. He is your beloved son. And he is that Passover lamb. He who knew no sin, but you made sin so that we might be made righteous. That he willingly, voluntarily took upon himself the curse of death. And he paid that price. We praise you for that, Father. Thank you. And may we be purified by the blood of the Lamb. May we have that precious blood upon our doorposts and lintel of our house so that we will not be destroyed, but that the destroyer will pass over us and we will be saved. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise be to you, Yehovah, forever and ever. And praise be to your son, Yeshua, forever and ever. Thank you, Holy God, for your word, for your truth. And thank you for that gift of salvation. And in the name of salvation, Yeshua, we praise you always. Asking that you be with us now as we get into your word. Amen. Thank you so very much, my brothers and sisters, for joining me in that word of prayer. Thank you, thank you. Page 191 of the Chronological Gospels. Uh, lots of notes, uh, commentary at the top, just to provide you with the context of how this is all taking place in fulfillment of these prophetic shadow pictures embedded 
in the, the Old Testament, embedded in the Tanakh, and certainly embedded in the spring feasts of Yehovah. Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that week-long feast, the Day of First Fruits, and then leading up to seven Sabbaths later, Shavuot, or in the Greek, Pentecost, Pentecosta, meaning the Feast of Weeks. Everything Yeshua fulfills perfectly. Notes. After a 13th month was added to the calendar year to allow the barley to reach the harvestable stage of Aviv, as it is called in Hebrew, the new moon of the Aviv barley would have been sighted at 1.45% illumination, 10.03 degrees above the horizon at sunset on Wednesday, April 14th of 28 of the Common Era, which would have been, it would have marked the first day of the biblical year, the month of the Aviv. And it was this year that the Passover lamb would be sacrificed on the afternoon of Wednesday, April 28th, which would be the 14th day of the first month. The Feast of Unleavened Bread would begin that day at sunset, the 15th day of the first month, the evening that the Passover meal is consumed, the lamb with the bitter herbs with the unleavened bread. This, that day, the preparation day of the Passover is the day that Yeshua, the Passover lamb, was sacrificed. And as all the Jews and all those that are celebrating the the Feast of Unleavened Bread and they're consuming that Passover meal, Yeshua, the Passover lamb, would have been buried, would have been in the heart of the earth, in the tomb that evening. The first fruits of the barley, known as the Bikarim, would be cut after sundown on Saturday, May 1st, and presented in the temple the following morning, Yom HaBikarim, on Sunday, May 2nd, the 18th day of the first month. Yeshua resurrected right there at sundown on the weekly Sabbath. Thus, when the sun goes down, it is the end of the Sabbath day and is the beginning of the next day, the first day of the week, the day of first fruits. And when Yeshua was raised, there were many that also were raised, and they appeared too many in the streets in the city, Jerusalem. And it would be the following morning, immediately after Yeshua appears to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, saying to her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and tell them that I send to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Yeshua would have then ascended to the Father with those that have been resurrected with him as they would be the, the first fruits of the dead and he would present that first fruits offering before his father in heaven. It, I mean, it's all being fulfilled. It's all there being fulfilled perfectly by Yeshua, proving the proof that he is, in fact, the Messiah. Yom HaBikarim, the day of the first fruits, is also the first day of the seven-week counting of the Omer, which culminates in the celebration of the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. Shavuot is the day following the seventh Sabbath, which is also the 50th day, Pentecosta in the Greek, Pentecost. Since the new moon at the end of the 12th month occurred very early that year, nearly a week before the vernal equinox, an Adar Bet, a 13th month, would have been uh, would have allowed the barley to mature sufficiently to, ce to celebrate the mandatory day of the first fruits during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Though it was theoretically possible for the barley to be in that stage of maturity known as Aviv at this time of year, we see that Yeshua, already in the vicinity of Jerusalem at this time, he made one more teaching circuit through Samaria and through the Galilee, and that itinerary would have given ample time for the barley to mature 
and for Yeshua to fulfill all of the prophetic shadow pictures embedded in the spring feasts that year, including his death as the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the month, three days and three nights in the grave to fulfill that sign of the prophet Jonah, and then presenting the first fruits from among the dead offering before the throne in heaven. This all set the stage for the fulfillment of the Feast of Shavuot, or Pentecost, seven Sabbaths later, which you can read about in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit of Almighty God, that fire from heaven, comes down and baptizes the disciples. It's all there, all being fulfilled perfectly by our Lord Yeshua. It is that proof that Yeshua is the one and only. He is the Messiah. There is not a single other person throughout all of human history that could even remotely come close to even being a possible candidate for the Messiah. Yeshua is the only candidate. He is the only one that fulfills the prophetic shadow pictures of his father, Yehovah. And so we turn to John chapter 11, verse 55, where it reads, Passover was nigh at hand, and many went up to Jerusalem before to purify, the, or excuse me, they went up before Passover to immerse themselves to mikvah and to purify themselves. And those purification uh, practices from Torah are, is, the, is the offering of sacrifices. So they went up to Jerusalem before Passover to mikvah and to offer sacrifices to purify themselves. And they looked for Yeshua and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple, saying, Do you think that he will not come up to the feast? You know, do you think that he's not going to show up? Of course he's going to show up. Why, would, why is it a guarantee that he's going to show up? Because, number one... He always keeps the commandments of his father, and to go up to Jerusalem for Passover is commanded in Torah. It's one of the three commanded feasts that you go up to Jerusalem. Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, uh, tabernacles in the fall. So they're saying, do you think that he, he's not going to come up to the feast? No, he's going to come up. It's a guarantee. So that's number one. He always keeps the commandments of his father. But this Passover, extremely significant, he's coming up to fulfill Passover. Both the chief priest, which this year was Caiaphas, and the Pharisees had given an order that if any man knew where he was, that he should declare it so that they might arrest him. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before Passover, Yeshua approached Bethany, where Lazarus lived. This is the same Lazarus who had died and whom Yeshua had raised from the dead. Lazarus, who was dead for those four solid days. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. Mark chapter 11, verse 1. When they came near to Jerusalem, approaching Bethphage a village known as House of Early Figs is the translation, as well as Bethany, Bethany, meaning House of Figs, on the Mount of Olives, Yeshua sent two of his disciples, saying, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you enter into that village, you will find a colt, which is a young donkey in this case, a male donkey, tied up on which no one has ever sat. No one has sat on this donkey. Now that's a detail that's provided in two of the Gospels, Mark and Luke. I turn to Luke uh, chapter 19, verse 29, where it says, When he came near to Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village over against us, and when you enter, you will find a colt tied 
upon which a man has never sat. Now, that's a detail provided by Mark and Luke, a important detail, but why is it important? Why is that significant, that no one has ever sat upon this male donkey, this young male donkey? One might think, as I believe most Christians do, that it's like, well, it's because Yeshua is the king and he's going to sit upon this donkey and it's it's not it's it it's an image of of royalty it's an image of that he is going to sit upon this animal upon which no one has ever sat in that that royal type of king image and i i agree it's like yeah that that's that's significant that's very significant that's important but there is an additional detail here that most do not see because they don't take all of the gospel records and lay them out in that linear chronology, that chronological order. There's that as well as the fact that most Christians believe in a Friday crucifixion and then an early Sunday morning resurrection, something that is not true, did not happen. Yeshua was not crucified on a Friday and resurrected early Sunday morning. He was crucified on a Wednesday and was resurrected right at sundown on the weekly Sabbath. When the sun sets, biblically speaking, it is the end of that day and the beginning of the other. So Yeshua was resurrected right there at sunset on the weekly Sabbath at the same time that the barley for the, day, for the first fruits offering was cut and that's an image of the resurrection that when Yeshua was raised, others were raised with him. And the following morning, the day of first fruits, is when that first fruits offering is presented in the temple. But by taking all of these events and laying them out in chron chronological order, we actually see that the day of the triumphal entry is not this, this Palm Sunday thing that's been invented by Catholicism, which most Christians today still celebrate. No, the triumphal entry occurred on the weekly Sabbath. It was the Sabbath day that Yeshua entered Jerusalem. And he entered Jerusalem on that colt, that young donkey, in order to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Zechariah. Quote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. There's that image of, you know, being a king. Well, you don't want, you know, the king to, sat on, to sit on an animal that someone else has sat on. I agree, but there's more. He is just and having salvation. <laughs> he is salvation, Yeshua. Lowly, he's humble and riding upon a male donkey, the young colt of a donkey, of a female donkey. And that is to fulfill, again, what was written by the prophet Zechariah. But when we see that it's actually on the Sabbath day, there's yet another significance to this whole, he's a colt on which no one has ever sat. And that is, commentary, the Torah instructs that we are to give our animals rest on the Sabbath day. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 14. Yet in order to fulfill the prophecy of the king riding into Jerusalem on a male donkey, Yeshua must do so on the tenth day of the month when the spotless lamb from Bethlehem is triumphal, triumphantly paraded into the gates as the Passover lamb for the nation. And that particular year, that prophetic event happened on the weekly Sabbath. The donkey chosen by Yeshua and prophesied by Zechariah hundreds of years previously has never worked a day in its life and therefore does not require rest on the Sabbath. So the Torah commands you to let your animals rest on the Sabbath day. Here is this uh, triumphal entry, it has to happen on that day, the 10th day of the month of the Aviv, the day when the high priest goes out to the sheepfolds of Bethlehem, finds a spotless, pure lamb from Bethlehem, and brings it through as that Passover lamb for the nation. Yeshua 
has to enter Jerusalem on that day to fulfill these shadow pictures. But that day was also the weekly Sabbath. He has to fulfill the prophecy that's been written by Zechariah. And so he chooses a, a donkey that has never worked a day in its life. He's not going to break his father's commandments. He's going to keep his father's commandments. And so he enters in riding a donkey that has never worked a day in its life and so doesn't need rest on the Sabbath day. The whole image of resting on the Sabbath day is that you have actually worked six days previous. This donkey has never worked before. So it is it is eligible <laughs> to actually be one of these animals that, quote, works on the Sabbath day. It's so incredible. It's so incredible how all of this comes together and is fulfilled, once again, perfectly by Yeshua. So Yeshua, getting back to Mark chapter 11, verse 2, he says to his disciples, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you enter into it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose him and bring him. And if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say to them, the master needs him. The king needs this animal. The king needs this animal in order to fulfill the word of Yehovah. And again, I'm just, I'm blown away by this. I'm, and I hope you are as well. How you see that it's just all there. It's there. No one has ever sat on this animal. This animal has never worked a day in its life. Therefore, this animal can be chosen to ride upon on the Sabbath day. And this animal is the only one, you know, that... Is, I mean, this animal is chosen by the master in order to fulfill what is written in the Tanakh, in the book of Zechariah. So why do you do this? The master needs him. The king needs this animal to fulfill the word of God. And he, the owner, will immediately send him, will allow you. Yeah, please, take him. They, the disciples, then went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside of a place at the main intersection in the village, and they loosed him. And they replied to those who stood there, just as Yeshua had instructed them, and they allowed them to go. It's, oh yeah, okay, the master needs it, all right. The king needs my animal, please, take him. Luke chapter 19, verse 29. When he came near to Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village over against us, and when you enter, you will find a colt tied, upon which no man has ever sat. You're going to find this, this animal there. How do you know that the animal is going to be there, Yeshua? Because I'm the Messiah, and I'm filled with the Spirit of Almighty God, and Almighty God knows all things. So, go. He'll be there. Just go. You'll find him. <laughs> loose that animal, the colt, and bring him. And if anyone asks, why are you loosing him? Say to, say to him, because our master has need of him. Those who were sent went their way and found it even as he had told them. And you would hope, you would hope that the disciples who have now been walking and talking and learning from Yeshua for over a year by this point, you would just hope that their attitude was, oh, okay, Yeshua says it'll, he'll be there, let's go. And there he is. They find the colt even as Yeshua had told them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners said to them, why do you loose the colt? And they replied, Our master has need of him. Matthew 21, verse 1. When they drew near to Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Yeshua sent two disciples, saying to them, Go immediately into the village over against you, where you shall find a donkey tied, and a young colt with her. Loose the colt and bring it to me. 
And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The master has need of him. The master has need of this animal. And he, the owner, will immediately release it. This was to be done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a male donkey, the young colt of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Yeshua commanded them, and they brought the colt. Now, the triumphal entry does not happen on this day. It happens the next day. How do we know that? Well, we know it because the Gospel of John is the one that actually lays out the order of these events. John chapter 12, verse 1, six days before Passover. Six days before Passover. That's verse 1. Verse 2 of John 12, he is in Bethany, and it's this evening that Mary the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus, comes to Yeshua with this very, very costly spike nerd ointment, and she anoints the feet of Yeshua as well as anoints his head, a, a symbol of uh, preparation for his burial. And then, verse 12 of John chapter 12, it says, on the next day, on the next day, Many of the people that came to the feast of Passover heard that Yeshua was coming to Jerusalem, and they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, meaning, save us, save us now. Blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of Yehovah, the triumphal entry. That's how we know that the actual day that this animal is retrieved is not the day that Yeshua actually enters Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. It's the day before. It's John that provides us with that chronology. Mark, Luke, Matthew, none of them provide us with that chronology. In fact, Matthew and Mark, their Gospels, they actually make a this, this event of Mary coming to anoint the feet and head of Yeshua quite confusing because how they present it in their Gospels is that it's long after the triumphal entry. It's actually like the evening right before the, the evening of the Last Supper. It's much, much, for, you know, it's several days further. But no, by looking at all of the Gospels together and then by looking at John's record where that day-to-day -day events are being laid out, we can see how these events actually transpire. So John says, six days before Passover is the day that he goes to Bethany. It's there when he arrives in Bethany that he sends his two disciples to get this male donkey. It's that evening that he, his feet and head are anointed by Mary, and it is John 12, 12, on the next day we have the triumphal entry. These are details that you're just not going to get unless you are studying all the Gospels together. And what I love so much about the chronological Gospels is that it just, it, it gets rid of so much of the confusion. It gets rid of those questions of, well, the, the evening that Yeshua's feet and head are anointed by Mary does that happen before the triumphal entry, or does that happen several days after the triumphal entry? Because Matthew and Mark says it happens after, and John says that it happens before. The reality is, Matthew and Mark don't say that it happens after, it's just that they record that event after, but they are not providing a day-to-day -day chronology. They simply record the event. So, Though John, this is uh, page 193 of the Chronological Gospels, notes, Though John records the timing of the event, Matthew and Mark introduce this event, 
of the anointing of Yeshua's feet and head, later in the narrative, at the time that Judas Iscariot makes the betrayal agreement with the chief priest. This incident illustrates that Judas Iscariot was not only a thief, but a growing enmity against Yeshua played out against the backdrop of Judas's dishonesty and desire for recognition, things that are driving him towards making that betrayal. And so, Chronological Gospels helps us to answer these questions. We've now seen that the reason why, one of the main reasons why, this donkey was chosen, upon which no one has ever sat, is because the day of the triumphal entry is going to be on the weekly Sabbath. And it's that same day that this animal was chosen, the day before the triumphal entry, is when Yeshua's feet and head are anointed. And it's only John that actually gives us the answer as to who is doing the anointing. Matthew and Mark do not include that detail. Matthew and Mark simply says that there was a woman who came to him. Uh, a, a woman came to him having an alabaster box of very costly ointment. If you're only reading Matthew and Mark, you have no idea who this woman is. John is the only one that gives us that answer. John chapter 12, starting in verse 2. There, in Bethany, they made supper for Yeshua. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those who reclined at the table with him. Mary, in the Hebrew, Miriam, took a pound of very costly spikenard ointment and anointed the feet of Yeshua and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. Then one of his disciples, Judas, Iscariot, Judas, the son of Simon of Iscariot, he who would soon betray Yeshua, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii, which would be 300 days wages for a minimum wage day laborer, and given to the poor? Right? That's what we should do with this, this ointment. We should sell it and give it to the poor. <laughs> This, Judas said, not because he cared for the poor, not because he had any love for the poor, but because he was a thief. He was the one that kept the disciples' purse, and he stole that which was put into it. A verse that really, really shows us who Judas Iscariot is at that core heart level something that was covered just a few days ago as we were seeking to answer that Judas Iscariot question. So he kept the disciples' purse and he stole that which was put into it. Then Yeshua said, leave her alone. She has reserved this, this ointment, this precious gift in preparation for my burial. I... As I have been prophesying to you, my disciples, so, so many times, as we just read previously from Mark 10 and Matthew 20, as they were going up to Jerusalem, Yeshua went before them, and they followed, and they were amazed and became afraid as he began to tell the twelve about the things that would happen to him. Look, we are going up to Jerusalem, where the Son of Man shall be delivered to the ruling priests and sages." And they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, who shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. But on the third day he shall rise again. This, this woman, Mary, Miriam, has done this, has reserved this precious gift in preparation for my burial. It's, it's an image of, a king. You would reserve such a gift for a king that this, sing, this, this very costly spikenard ointment is something that is worth a full year of wages for a day laborer. And Yeshua is saying, this has been reserved. She has reserved this gift for me in preparation for my burial. Verse 8, you will always have the poor with you, 
You're always going to have the poor with you. But you will not always have me. I'm only going to be here for a few more days. And then I go into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And then I'm only going to be physically with you for 40 days beyond that. And then I ascend into heaven. And spiritually speaking, for those who have been born of the Spirit of God, then yes, the, the, the Spirit of the Almighty given to us through that sacrifice of Yeshua, spiritually speaking, then yes, Yehovah and Yeshua are with us even to the end of the age, just as Yeshua says in, um, in the Great Commission to his disciples. But physically speaking, Yeshua, the bridegroom, he has to go away. He has to go away for a time to prepare a place for his bride, something that is beautifully fulfilled in the Hebrew uh, ceremony of the engagement and wedding, that the bridegroom would make a agreement with the father of the bride, the bridegroom would pay a dowry that the father of the bride sets, and at that point, the engagement is set. They are, they are sealed to be married. They are engaged. The bridegroom leaves to prepare a place for the bride, and the bride then waits for a year, a year-long period, and every night that bride is lighting a lamp, putting it in the window to be a symbol to all the world saying, I'm taken, I'm spoken for. You, you would-be suitors out there of the world, don't even, don't even ask. Don't even try. Because I am spoken for, and he that I am betrothed to will return very soon, and when he returns, we are going to be married. And I will then be with him, the bridegroom, from that point forward. All fulfilled by Yeshua. That... At Yeshua's crucifixion, he is there paying the dowry, the marriage dowry that the Father has set, that price that the Father sets. And that for those who will come to Yeshua, believe in Yeshua, follow Yeshua, you are then born of the Spirit of God and you are part of the engagement, that you are engaged to the bridegroom and the image is that we need to keep ourselves faithful. We need to keep ourselves pure. We need to wait and endure faithfully to the end when the bridegroom will return. We need to be lighting that lamp, spiritually speaking, in our own lives as a symbol saying to all the world, I am not available. I am not available. I am spoken for. My husband, my the bridegroom that I am betrothed to, he is returning soon. And when he returns, I will be with him from that point forward. We will be married. Something that you can read about in Revelation chapter 19, what is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it is his wife that has made herself ready. It's so incredible. It's so beautiful. All of this so perfectly fulfilled by Yeshua. So, verse 8, John chapter 12, you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. I'm going away for a time, and then I will return. And will, as Yeshua said earlier in the Gospels, when the Son of Man returns, will I find any real faith remaining on the earth will i find any will i find my bride waiting for me faithfully and we're the ones that have to answer that question it's a question that's asked to each and every one of us will he find us as that faithful bride Will he find us as those faithful, wise servants that have been doing what we are supposed to do in the time that he is away? But he's returning, and he's returning soon. If Yeshua fulfilled 
every prophetic shadow picture concerning his first coming to the very day and hour that it has been practiced for 1,500 years by the Israelites, what makes you think that he won't also fulfill perfectly all of the prophecies of his second coming embedded in the fall feasts of Yehovah? Of course he will. He will. We cannot be doubters. We cannot be found among those that Peter is prophesying about in 2 Peter chapter 3, saying, where's the promise of his coming? Right? For since the, our ancestors have all died, you know, everything has continued as it has been since the day of, since the beginning of the world. And it's just going to keep on going as it's always been going. No, it won't. Sand is running out of the hourglass. And the time of the end of the age of this fallen world is fast approaching the time when the bridegroom will return. Question is, will we be found among those that are wise virgins or are we going to be foolish virgins? Again, these are questions that only we can answer. I hope <laughs> that I, with you, we will be among the wise who will have endured faithfully to the end, lighting our lamp every single day, putting it there in the window of our own house, letting that light of God shine out from us as a symbol to all the world saying, I'm spoken for, I'm not for any of you. Okay? I have a husband, he's coming back, and I'm going to be a part of that marriage supper of the Lamb. Love it. Many of the Pharisees, <laughs> verse 9 of John chapter 12, many of the Pharisees, or in the King James it reads, people of the Jews, but we've already established you know, much, much earlier in the chronological gospel series that in the gospel of John, whenever John writes the Jews, the, con the context is always in reference to the Pharisees. It's in reference to those religious leaders. And it says, many of the Pharisees knew that he, Yeshua, was there, and they came not only to see Yeshua, but that they also might see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, roughly one month earlier. But, and this is what's so astounding to me, this is absolutely it's just, it blows my mind. Verse 10, John chapter 12. But the ruling priests had also conspired to put Lazarus to death, as well as Yeshua. They've been conspiring to put Yeshua to death since the previous year's uh, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks. And they only, more, with more determination, were committed to put Yeshua to death after the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, after those four days. And so here in verse 10 and verse 11 of John 12, it reads, But the ruling priests had also conspired to put Lazarus to death, as well as Yeshua. And their reason? Why? Why are they, gonna, why are they conspiring to kill Lazarus? Because... Lazarus was the reason that many of the Pharisees had abandoned them and believed Yeshua, had come to believe that Yeshua is the prophet like Moses that had been prophesied by Yehovah through Moses as recorded in Deuteronomy 18. Many of the Pharisees, many of their, their disciples had abandoned them and come to believe in Yeshua because of the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And so, what do the ruling priests want to do? Well, we're not just going to kill Yeshua. We're going to kill Lazarus too. I... I got to be perfectly honest with you. I can't understand that kind of person I just I can't it, it is so mind-blowing I mean I know 
that there are these types of people in the world. I know that there are these types of people. There have always been these types of people. Um, there are these same types of people today that whatever they have, whatever you know, supposed authority or power that they seem to have or you know, whatever, they'll do anything to cling to it. They'll do anything to hold on to it. Even being in just complete and open rebellion against God and against the Messiah. Just the, the, the light of truth is like this giant spotlight that's shining so brightly right in their eyes that it's, it's blinding light. But they will say that, you know, there, there's no light at all. They'll, they'll fight against perfect truth just so that they can hang on to their, you know, their whatever power or authority or material goods or wealth or whatever it is. And so these ruling priests are so wicked. They are so consumed by the spirit of the enemy that not only are they conspiring to put Yeshua to death, but hey, Yeshua raised this Lazarus from the dead a month ago. We're going to put him to death too. Because as long as Lazarus is alive, oh, we're just going to you know, lose more and more of our followers. We're going to lose more and more of our power. <laughs> it's truly astounding. It is so astounding. I can't fathom that heart. I don't understand it. I know it's real. I know that there are people that like this, but it truly just is, it just goes right over, you know, my head and my heart. I don't, I can't grasp it. You would think, you really would think that anyone who sees such incredible miracles would repent, would change, would have their eyes opened, would have their hearts softened. You would think that. In fact, that's what the parable of the uh, rich man and Lazarus, as recorded in Luke chapter 16, is all about. You have this rich man that is pleading with Father Abraham in the parable, saying, hey, if you'll just send this Lazarus, who is now dead, if you'll just raise him from the dead and send him to my brothers, to my fellow you know, uh, religious leaders and rich men or whatever it is, if you'll just send him to them, it's a guarantee that they're going to repent. It's just, there's no possible chance that they won't. And Yeshua says in this parable, the reply is, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the Old Testament. They have the Hebrew scriptures. And if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, then they won't listen to anything, even if one comes to them that's been raised from the dead. And here we see it so perfectly fulfilled. Yeshua raises Lazarus from the dead after those four days. Just, and he, and he waited intentionally to make sure that everyone knew this wasn't some mistake like maybe somebody could say with the raising of the son of the, the widow of the village of Nain or the raising of the daughter of Jairus. You know, maybe, maybe it was a mistake. Maybe they just had fallen asleep or they were unconscious or something like that. And maybe they weren't really dead. No, Yeshua waits for Lazarus. He waits to make absolutely certain. It's like everyone knows this man is dead. There's no possible chance that he's not dead. And then he raises Lazarus from the dead. And you would think, no one could have such a hard heart that they wouldn't change. But if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, if they won't obey the word of God that's laid out before them, the same word of God that's been laid out before you and me, then even a miracle like the raising of Lazarus from the dead, will not change their hearts. In fact, they are so consumed by darkness and evil 
that they will want to put that same man to death just to cling to whatever authority they, they believe they have. It's very real that these people exist. They, they've always existed and they still exist to this day. These are the types that, as Yeshua says in Matthew 23, how can you possibly escape the damnation of hell? These types of people can't because they won't repent. And because they won't repent, therefore they can't escape the damnation of hell. They, they by their own choices, seal their fate forever and ever. They, by their own actions, guarantee themselves a place in the lake of fire burning with brimstone. They are children of hell. They are children of their father, the devil. They are vipers and serpents. They are blind guides, blind chairs of authority. They are the blind that lead the blind. Why did sepulchers on the outside? They look oh so holy on the outside. But inside they are filled with dead men's bones and all uncleanness. The ruling priests had also conspired to put Lazarus to death, as well as Yeshua. Because Lazarus was the reason that many of the Pharisees, many of their disciples, had abandoned them and came to believe in Yeshua. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 6. When Yeshua was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, that is Simon the healed leper, he's been healed, he has now been cleansed, there came to him a woman having an alabaster box of very costly ointment and poured it on his head as he reclined at dinner. But when the disciples saw it, they had indignation. And that's what's interesting. Matthew and Mark records it in the plural that it wasn't just Judas Iscariot, but there were some of the disciples that had this indignation. Certainly the focus is Judas Iscariot. Perhaps Judas is the one that, you know, says these words, you know, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii or sold? You know, it, it's worth a, like a year's wage and it should have been given to the poor. And maybe there were some of the other disciples that were like, yeah, you're right, you're right, Judas Iscariot, why wasn't it? So Matthew and Mark include that detail, that, it's, that there were some of the disciples that you know, were moved to indignation, saying, what is the purpose of such waste? This ointment might have been sold for, for a lot, for much, and given to the poor. And when Yeshua understood it, he said to them, why trouble you the woman? For she hath done a good work upon me. For you always have the poor with you, but me you do not always have. For in that she has poured this ointment on my body. She did it for my burial. Preparation for my burial. Truth I say to you. Now I love this detail. This is provided by both Matthew and Mark. Verse 13 of Matthew 26, and then verse 9 of Mark 14. Truth I say to you, wherever this gospel, wherever this good news of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world, that which this woman has done shall also be told as a memorial of her. And Mark 14, verse 9, Truth I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the whole world, this which she has done shall also be told as a memorial of her, in remembrance of her, of this generous act of kindness that she has done for me, for the Messiah. And here we are, coming up on exactly 2,000 years later, the year 2028 will be exactly 2,000 years, so we're only eight years shy of that 2,000-year mark. And here we are reading these words. Here we are feasting in the truth of God. Here we are remembering that generous act that Mary, the sister of Martha, does for Yeshua, the king, in preparation 
for his burial. Just as Yeshua prophesied, it will be spoken that wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, that which this woman has done shall also be told as a memorial of her. But it's interesting that, you know, Matthew and Mark, they chose not to actually reveal the, the identity of this woman. It's only by reading all three gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and John, where this event is recorded, that you see that this is Mary, the sister of Martha. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 3. When they were in Bethany, Yeshua reclined at dinner in the house of Simon, the healed leper. And in came a woman with an alabaster box of very precious spikenard ointment, and she broke the box and poured it on Yeshua's head. And there were some that had indi- and there were some that had indignation within themselves, and said, Why was this ointment wasted? It could have been sold for more than three hundred denarii and given to the poor. And they murmured against her. But Yeshua said, Leave her alone. Why are you harassing her? She has done a good work for me. You will always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you may do good to them. But you will not always have me. Mary just moved, I believe, moved by the the spirit of the Almighty God, was moved to do this for Yeshua. That this precious, precious gift was reserved for Yeshua as this this preparation for a kingly burial. And they, the several, you know, some of the disciples, they're murmuring against her. But Yeshua is saying, "Leave her alone. What she has done, this is a good work for me. You always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good to them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she is able to do. She has come beforehand." to anoint my body for burial. And you know, I find it really beautiful and so powerful that this this ointment, very, very costly ointment, it's worth pretty much a, a year's wage. Now, why do I find that powerful and profound? It goes back to what I was talking about earlier with that whole prophetic shadow picture of the the Hebrew wedding ceremony. Bridegroom makes an arrangement with the father of the bride. A dowry is set by the father of the bride. The bridegroom pays that dowry. The marriage or the the wedding is, is set. The engagement is now set. They are engaged. Bride to be, bridegroom. The bridegroom then leaves for a period of time to prepare a place for his bride, which Yeshua says to his disciples there in John chapter 14, I go now to prepare a place for you. The bridegroom leaves for a period of time. What's that period of time? One year. That's the period. How much is the, what's the value of this, this ointment? It's pretty much a year's value, a year's wages for a minimum wage day laborer. I believe that it's all coming together as that image of we who are called, invited to be the bride to the bridegroom, we are to keep ourselves pure and faithful during the time that the bridegroom has has gone away to prepare a place for us. And during that year time, Not only are we to be faithful, but we are also to use the resources that God has given to us for for God and for Christ, for the furthering of the gospel, that we are to do all things for God and for Christ, that we are to, verse 8, Mark chapter 14, do what we are able to do. She has done what she is able to do. She has this this gift, this resource that's been given to her. What is she going to do with it? What is she going to do with it? She gives it 
to Yeshua. It's the exact same thing for each and every one of us. We all have resources, both physical resources, mental resources, spiritual, emotional resources. We have the, the powerful resources of the truth of God's word. We have all of these things and blessings that God has given to us. The question is, during that, that year-long period when the bridegroom is away and we, the bride, are keeping ourselves faithful, what are we going to be doing with those resources? Are we going to use them for ourselves? Are we going to use them for you know, any other purposes? Or are we going to dedicate these resources to God the Father and Jesus the Son? I hope that your answer is the same as mine, which is, I'm going to do all that I am able to do. Just as Mary. She has done what she is able to do. I'm going to do what I am able to do. God has given me resources. I am going to use them for the bridegroom, for my husband-to-be, who is returning and he's returning soon it's like the the anticipation it, every day it just it's growing and growing and building and building and building i know he's coming soon and when he comes i want to be found and i want you to be found as one of those that still has real faith living faith on the earth You will always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good to them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she is able to do. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. And truth I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the whole world, this which she has done shall also be told as a memorial of her. I love what... Michael Rood says concerning the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The book of the Acts was written by Luke, the same Luke that wrote the Gospel of Luke. And the, the time period of the book of the Acts is over a 20-year span from when it begins to the final recordings of the book of the Acts. However, the book of the Acts is still being written. It's being written in, he written in heaven. And you and I are disciples of Yeshua that are being written about. And I don't know about you, but I know that I, for myself, I want to be recorded in the book of the Acts, the, the, the book that is still being recorded in heaven. I want to be found among those that are the faithful bride to the bridegroom that in the future, whenever the truth is you know, being preached throughout the whole world, the things that I have done, and I hope the same thing for you, you desire the same thing, the things that you have done shall also be told as a memorial of me and you. And this is where we get into something really, really profound and really beautiful. In a previous teaching in the Chronological Gospel series, a teaching entitled, Mary, 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 Which Mary? We talk about the three different Marys that are recorded in the Gospels. Mary, the mother of Yeshua, Mary Magdalene, and then Mary, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus. Three different Marys, all of them with the exact same name. Mary being the English translation of the Hebrew name Miriam. Extremely popular name. Very, very popular name in the Hebrew. Going back to Miriam, the sister of Moses, the sister of Aaron. And What's really powerful is that we know exactly who this Mary is who anoints the feet and head of Yeshua with this very costly spikenard ointment. And the house is filled with the fragrance of the ointment. Uh, 
Ooh, I just saw that. That's cool. The house. An image of us, our lives. The house of God, the temple of God. I hope that our house, this temple, will be filled with the fragrance of the ointment. In other words, be filled with those, those, those delicious fragrances of the righteous acts, righteous actions. The very things that the bride is clothed with as revealed in Revelation chapter 19. That she, the wife to the lamb, has made herself ready and it was given to her to wear fine clothing, a beautiful wedding garment, wedding dress. And the wedding dress is a symbol of the righteous actions of the saints. May our house be filled with the fragrance of the ointment, those things that we do for our Father in heaven, and for our Lord Yeshua. But, uh, getting back to this, this whole uh, Mary, Mary, Mary thing, we know it's Mary, the sister of Martha, that does this anointing of Yeshua's feet and head with this uh, very costly ointment. And she wipes his feet with her hair. We don't know for absolute certain... Uh, who the other woman was previously, as recorded in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. We don't know for certain if it is Mary Magdalene, but it could be. It is entirely possible that it could be. Because immediately after this previous event, getting into Luke chapter 8, verse 1, it reads, Afterward, Yeshua went throughout every city and village, preaching and announcing the kingdom of God. The twelve went with him, as well as certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. And the first one mentioned is Miriam, Mary from Migdal, Mary Magdalene, out of whom went seven demons. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, who ministered to Yeshua of their substance of their resources, very much like Mary, the sister of Martha, is ministering to Yeshua of her substance, of this very costly ointment, we know that these women are also doing the same, ministering to Yeshua of their substance. And it's immediately before we have this event recorded in Luke 7, starting in verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Yeshua to dine with him. So he went into his house and reclined for dinner. And while Yeshua dined in the Pharisee's house, a woman from the city, a sinner, which we can de definitely say Mary Magdalene would have been, as out of whom went seven demons, she had you know demons within her, a woman from the city, a sinner, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stooped at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears and then wiped them with the hair of her head. She then kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he thought to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who this woman is and what kind of woman it is that touches him. She is obviously a sinner." And Yeshua said to him, Simon, I have something to say to, you, say to you. And Simon, the Pharisee, replied, Master, say on. And he gives this parable about two people that had a debt. One had a larger debt than the other. Both were forgiven. Who would love more? The one that was forgiven most. And this woman has such incredible, incredible love. So you look at all of the parallels between these two events, and we're going to say that, hypothetically speaking, possibly that this first woman is Mary Magdalene. Two different Marys anointing Yeshua's feet with very costly ointment and wiping his feet with their hair, recorded two different events. Both events actually take place in a house where the owner of the house his name is Simon. <laughs> the, 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 the parallels are just absolutely mind-blowing. So, 
just hypothesizing that this first woman here is Mary Magdalene. We have to make that hypothesis. Two different Marys, two different times, at two different houses, of two different Simons, <laughs> one named Simon the Pharisee, the other being Simon the healed leper, both of which, these two different Marys, anointing Yeshua's feet with ointment, wiping his feet with their hair. It, it's really, really incredible when it, you look at all the parallels. But that's not the, the, uh, uh, the, the truly powerful message that I came across in preparation for this teaching. The truly powerful message is actually found in the meaning of the name Miriam, the Hebrew name Miriam or its English equivalent, Mary. One needs to ask, why are there so many women that are named Mary? The mother of Yeshua, Mary Magdalene, Mary the sister of Martha, Mary, Mary, Mary. Everyone seems to be <laughs> named Mary or Miriam in the Hebrew. Why is this a significant name? Is it just going back to, like, in remembrance of Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron? Possibly. But it could be something else. It could be deeper than that, even on a really profound spiritual level. As I was studying this for today's teaching about uh, Mary, the sister of Martha, anointing Yeshua's head and feet and wiping his feet with her hair, I thought to myself, well, what is the meaning of the name Mary? What's the meaning of the name Miriam? And when I looked it up, I was actually kind of, I was kind of shocked because I went into it thinking that it was like, well, it must have like some like really profound, you know, uh, meaning like it's, you know, uh, it means, you know, uh, one that is, you know, humble or, you know, something along those lines. But no, that's not what it means. The meaning of Miriam, it's from the, it's from the Hebrew root Mara, which means bitterness or it means rebellious. And you're like, what? <laughs> Mary or Miriam from the verb, Hebrew verb Mara means to be rebellious or the verb Marar, bitterness or to be bitter. And for that reason, there's, there is some debate as far as exactly what it means. There are some that uh, mean that it means sea of bitterness or rebelliousness. Uh, others, you know, suggest that it could uh, be from another root that means wished for child. But most agree that it means bitterness or rebelliousness. And you're like, why on earth are so many people being named Mary then, if, it, that, if that's what it means? <laughs> This is where it gets really cool. Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, she was born and raised in Egypt, as were all the Israelites during that time period. They were all born and all raised in Egypt. So it is certainly possible, even, I would say, you know, um, very, very likely that many of these Israelites were given names that had, you know, that were actually from Egypt, that were Egyptian names, or certainly roots in Egypt. And it turns out that the name Miriam is found, or there is a root in Egyptian that, um, you know, very likely it's, it's from, that Miriam is originally from Egypt. It's an Egyptian name. And its Egyptian name, derived in part from the root mira, means beloved, or from the verb to love, mir. <laughs> okay, let's now break this down. In Hebrew, in Hebrew, Miriam from the root mara or marar means rebelliousness or bitterness, like a sea of bitterness. But its Egyptian root is from 
is from mir or murray, meaning beloved or to love. I look at this and I believe that there's a spiritual message here for each and every one of us. That each and every one of us, we start out as a Miriam with that Hebrew meaning rebelliousness. Every single one of us have, have been in rebellion against God and against Christ at some point in our lives. We, we've all done it. We've all done it. We've all been in rebellion. And in a state of rebellion against God and Christ, well, then you cannot be considered as the bride to the bridegroom. If you are in rebellion against truth, well, then by definition, it means that you're living in lies. You're not in light. You're not a child of the day, but you are in darkness. You are a child of the night. You are not a... A candidate, you know, to be the bride to the bridegroom. However, what do we see with Mary, the mother of Yeshua? What do we see with Mary Magdalene? And what do we see with Mary, the sister of Martha? We see women that are humble. We see women that are contrite. We see women who willingly and freely submit themselves before the will of God and the will of the Messiah. As, is, I mean, that is certainly true with Mary, the mother of Yeshua. It's true with Mary Magdalene. One of the, uh, only one of two women that was there actually at the crucifixion of Yeshua. That we've got, you know, Mary, the, the mother of Yeshua, and Mary Magdalene that's there at the, the crucifixion. And here we have Mary, the sister of Martha, that is anointing Yeshua's feet with this very costly spike nerd ointment, something that very possibly Mary Magdalene did as well, administering to Yeshua of her substance. Rebe someone that was in rebellion, rebelliousness against God and Christ, but through their own choices, they humble themselves before the master and in so doing, they become beloved. Beloved of the master. In so doing, they become the bride to the bridegroom. So that when the bridegroom returns, he looks at all of us, these Marys or these Miriams, if you will, that at one point were in bitterness and rebellion against him, he looks at us and says, because you have submitted yourselves before me and before my father, you are not in rebellion anymore, but you are in humble submission. And in that humble submission, I choose you as my beloved. <laughs> Mir Miriam, from the Hebrew, meaning bitterness or rebellion or rebelliousness, but from the Egyptian, very likely where Miriam came from, as Miriam was born and raised in Egypt, it's derived in part from the roots, meaning beloved or to love. That I find to be a beautiful message to each and every one of us. You, me, all of us. We have all been in rebellion against God and Christ. But let's make the choice. Let's, let's follow after the examples of the three Marys that are in the Gospels. Let's choose to humble ourselves before God and Christ. To put away our rebellion. To put away our sin. To put away our past lives. To no longer be slaves to sin, but now slaves to righteousness. Let's submit our will before the will of God and Christ, our bridegroom, so that when Yeshua returns, he will find real living faith on the earth, and he will look upon us not as, not as re being in rebellion against him, but he will look upon us, and he will call us his beloved, the ones that he loves most, that he was willing to suffer and die for.
He, he's, he's willing to suffer and die for all. But ultimately, it's only those that come to Christ that the debt is paid for. If someone continues in rebellion against God and Christ, then their debt, they have to pay. <laughs> Christ hasn't paid the debt for them because they choose to not accept that payment. They have to pay it themselves. I love that. I love that message. And I hope that this day's teaching from the Chronological Gospels has been a great blessing to each and every one of you. Let's make that choice, my brothers and sisters. It's well within our power to do so. Let's make that choice to use our resources to do what we are able to do to further the work of God for the blessing of God and his son Yeshua. Let's make that choice to not be in rebellion, but let's choose to be beloved of our Father and our Lord. Thank you so very much for joining me for this evening's family scripture study from the Chronological Gospels. Thank you so very much, my brothers and sisters. And a special thank you to those that support the work of this ministry at patreon.com slash yhvh. Thank you so very much for your support, my friends. And thank you also to those of you that will make that choice to go to patreon.com slash yhvh and choose to be one of our patrons that supports this work on a month-to-month -month basis. That you desire to see this work not just continue, but you desire to see it thrive. You desire to see it grow. You desire to see this work reach more and more people as we continue teaching and preaching from the word of truth. So thank you so very much to all those that have supported, continue to support, and thank you to those that will make that choice to support this work. And we will see you tomorrow evening for our Shabbat teaching as we continue in the Chronological Gospels covering the triumphal entry of our Lord Yeshua, the King, into Jerusalem. Riding into Jerusalem upon that male donkey, that colt, upon which no one has ever sat, it's never worked a day in its life, so that all of these prophetic shadow pictures can be fulfilled and the commandments of Yehovah our Father will not be broken. Yeshua is the Messiah, and he is... <sighs> he triumphantly entered Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago, and he will triumphantly return to this world in the very, very near future when all enemies will be put under his feet and he will reign for a thousand years as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's a day that I am looking forward to with <laughs> just and more anticipation than I can put words to. So I hope that you feel the exact same. Join me tomorrow for our Shabbat teaching as we cover that event, the triumphal entry. And until then, I wish you all shalom.